Thank you, Janice. Today we're going to continue and finish up Luke chapter 4. Um, and this uh, final part of the chapter is interesting because, um, well, Jesus has gone from the insiders of his own hometown and he's gone and left them and gone to Capernaum. And of course, this is some of the, the points we made in our uh, last sermon was that Jesus' self-identification as the servant of God, which was a messianic claim, raised doubts in his hometown audience. Um, they, they said, well, isn't this Joseph's son? And we, we talked about Jesus' reaction really contextualizes us for this, contextualizes this for us, and that um, he responds with a rebuttal rather than with an affirmation. He says, well, you know, basically they're, they're, their questioning was of a heart of disbelief. And um, this foreshadows the denial of the Jews, Jesus' own people, um, like it would say in John 1.11, right? That he came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. God's plan ended up, Jesus' um, rebuttal to them in, in denying and doubting his messianic claim was, well, didn't you know that there was, there was Gentiles saved in Israel in the days of Elijah and Elisha? When Israelites were suffering, the p- repentant that came to him, they found rest, they found peace and healing. And so his point to them is, um, is you know, Nazareth need not apply. I'm the Messiah either way. <laughs> the, the first claim caused the, his neighbors to doubt, but the second claim um, of the preference of God to, to show love to the Gentiles, even where the suffering inside the covenant community, um, where they weren't repentant, God showed preference to the Gentiles. Um, and his hometown was brought to murderous intent, right? It's important to note uh, that the Gentiles that Jesus brings up in that last sermon we talked about, that Elijah and Elisha served, they were the oppressed that the servant was sent to, to, to serve. Um, in Isaiah 61, he says, this is satisfied in your hearing, you know, that the servant is here. I am here to bind up the brokenhearted, to, uh, to preach the gospel to the poor, to set the captives free. And he's, he brings up these Gentiles that were oppressed in their own right. The widow, that's a very clear one. She was a widow. She was about to have her final meal when Elijah, Elisha met her. And then Elijah was sent Naaman, a leper. And le- the leper, of course, was himself an oppressor. He, he was an exile maker um, of the kingdom of Israel. And yet he was willing to repent, willing to go through uh, the, the process of healing, and he showed faith by his actions and was healed. Um, and so Nazareth need not apply is both bold and provocative um, that Jesus' messiahship is not conditional on the acceptance of others. Jesus' messiahship uh, is, is really just, it's just who he is. Um, whether or not he's accepted or endorsed by people, Jesus is the messiah. And his messiahship was not conditional on our acceptance. And we have to remember that we need not apply either, and that Jesus has come, he's offering the gospel, and he's going to be king whether or not we accept him. What makes him good, what makes him worthy of worship, is not that he's a petulant God that's insecure in his needs and he's going to people to find people to give him praise, to give him power. He's secure enough in his self-understanding to know I am God and I will preach the truth to you one way or the other. I'll make a way for you to be saved and you can take it or leave it. That's the amazing thing that we see in Jesus' presentation of the gospel. In his own words, it it often comes through as as very firm and matter of fact. Jesus, he's not insecure. He's very secure in saying, this is the truth, you can accept me, and I will love you. But guess what? I'm a good God, and I'll find somebody who can praise me if you'll refuse. That was the the case to the the insiders um, in Nazareth, and now he is going to Capernaum in our final part of the chapter today. We see, uh, we're going to start in in Luke 4.31. This is Luke's account of Jesus' first miracle. Um, Jesus' first sermon was last week. This is Jesus' first miracle, according to Luke. Um, And uh, where Jesus' ministry has already popped off on quite a footing of, uh, you know, a bit of contention um, it's going to continue, and that Jesus is now going on assault. Where the Spirit led him into the wilderness, 
in to the wilderness to be um, tried by the devil. Then he was led into Nazareth to be denied by his own people. Jesus is moving on to preach in the synagogues. He's actually still very firm in his calling and belief. He's not left the synagogues. He's not said, oh, it's time to give up. He's just moving on to a different town. He's going to go show his power in a different town. And so Jesus, he's going, and he's going to do his first miracle, and strikingly, it's a demonic exorcism. It's a bit of spiritual assault on the world of darkness. And this is a very big point for us because the Old Testament has no accounts of exorcisms. Isn't that interesting? In all the incredible stories of the Old Testament, there is no excising of demons that we ever see in the Old Testament. This is something unique to Jesus in his messianic role and unique to his ability um, to establish his kingdom on earth. And this is something that Luke goes back to constantly, exploring the idea of how he has authority over the demonic realm and what that means for us. And so we're going to unpack some of that today. So let's read uh, 31 and 32. 31 and 32. And he came to Capernaum, a city of Galilee, and he was teaching them on the Sabbath. And they were amazed at his teaching, for his message was with authority. In the synagogue, there was a man oppressed by the spirit of an unclean demon, and he cried out with a loud voice, Let us alone. Uh, What business do do we have with each other? And I'll I'll stop there because I've already gone too far. Um, Jesus just as he told the Nazareth, uh, people in Nazareth he, he would uh, do, he says, you know, you're going to tell me, you know, physician, heal yourself as you healed people in Capernaum. And here he goes, off to Capernaum. He's going to do some amazing things. And this was a highly integrated society, um, especially with Rome, between Jews and Gentiles. You know, of course, this is where we end up meeting a lot of the disciples There was important trade routes, um, tax stands, a large fishing industry, and a new synagogue, of which you can see the foundations in this picture. The white sort of marble, or whatever stone that is on top, is is older than Jesus' time, but the black sort of foundations, that would have been the new synagogue that Jesus would have um, preached in, I believe, is, is what some research has showed me. So the new synagogue is sitting on the foundations of the old synagogue. The one, the Blackstone one, would have been in the time of Jesus. And so he's gone to this new synagogue, uh, this burgeoning a commu- community, and he kept his habit of preaching in the synagogues. Jesus is going to the place where the Torah, where the word, is most respected, and he's making his case for it being the Messiah. He's not out in the wilderness like John. He's in the heart of Jewish worship and saying, you guys love the Torah, you're going to love me. If you understand the Torah, you're going to love me. (laughs) And that's, of course, what almost got him killed in in our last um, message. But uh, so he kept his, his, uh, uh, his habit of preaching in the synagogues. Jesus is undeterred. He's led by the Spirit, not by public opinion. Um, And when Jesus is rejected by the Insiders, he's gone to the outsiders, and he's going to get a much better reception, a a theme that we're going to see throughout Luke and Acts. Um, In 32, you see that his word, uh, the word that is frequently ascribed to to Jesus, starting in uh, verse 32 and and in 36, this word authority, which is the Greek word exousia, maybe, is how you pronounce it, um, it occurs 15 times in Luke. Uh, and is a designation of the sovereign freedom to declare, of Jesus' sovereign freedom to declare and embody the gospel, to prevail over evil demons, and to forgive sins. So Jesus is coming in here, like the kids would say, like a boss. Lane, you got that? <laughs> yeah, so it's, it's even an old one for Lane, but he's coming in with authority. He's coming in with strength and power, and Jesus here is really being not just, uh, the you know, a man, but he's really being a man, like a a godly, a strong man. He is uh, somebody that's commanding, um, that's credible, um, and and, and that's credible. Jesus' ministry is really quite a a masculine ministry, especially when he's going to war on evil forces that are oppressing people. Jesus is not some crossbreed between a hippie and a care bear. He's not just like, oh man, it's just got to love. Ah, oh, you demons don't. No. <laughs> no, he's pretty uh, assertive. He's an imposing force. And when he's taking up the cause of the hopeless, of the brokenhearted, and the poor, he is combative. He is really combative. He's going to war here. It says in 34, um, 
Let us alone. What business do we have with each other, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. And so this man in the synagogue, he's to, possessed by a demon, um, and Jesus is now setting apart, um, well, I guess he's setting forward his, his agenda of setting the captives free. These people are under demonic oppression. And when we think of captives, we think of prison or we think of exile. And we're, when we're talking about a spiritual oppression, that's an oppression that no kingdom except a spiritual kingdom could overthrow. That is a darkness that you could never be retrieved from with the power of, of just you know, flesh and blood or, or, or swords and, and arrows. Jesus is coming to do a work that had never been done to release spiritual captives, just as he said he would um, when he quoted Isaiah 61 and said, this is satisfied in your hearing. Jesus' first miracles in this whole passage, um, oh, well, most of the passage at least, are associated with excising demons. This miracle is striking, like I said, because it's not in the Old Testament. Anywhere else in the Old Testament, this is something new, a new work of the Spirit and the new age of redemption that Jesus um, came to, to usher in. The idea is really that the skull crusher is here. We were promised in Genesis, I think it's 3.15, that the seed of the, of, the, of the woman would crush the seed of the serpent. The seed of the woman is here, and he's come to crush evil. He's come to do war. He's launching an assault. He's not a, a passive actor in this ministry of obedience. His ministry of obedience to the Father is leading him into conflict with evil. And so the skull crusher is here. Jesus, the servant, is the destroyer of evil. Verse 34, we see the devil uh, inside, or the demon, sorry, inside this man, um, tell Jesus, or call him, basically, we know you're the Holy One of God. The only other, other verse used to describe Samson, uh, or sorry, the only other verse that says, that calls somebody the Holy One of God is used to describe Samson and judges 1617. And it's related to Samson's Nazarite vow. So Samson was a man that was set aside and told, you know, he will live by a special code of holiness. He's not going to cut his hair. He's not going to touch dead things. He's not going to, um, you know, eat unclean foods. He won't drink wine. And, and he'll be a man of great strength. And he was going to do war against the Philistines, uh, the Philistines, people that were sort of representative of this kingdom of evil. They were following the gods that opposed the true God. And so God brought a holy one that was going to be holy and set apart and very strong to destroy. And this is the word that the devil or inside, or the demon, sorry, inside this oppressed man uses to describe Jesus. He says, you're like, we know you're like this Samson-esque kind of man. You're holy and you're strong. Um, Jesus' strength and holiness has already been proven against Satan, right? In the wilderness, Jesus stood up. In his weakest moment, he stood up in opposition to Satan and was faithful to his father. At his very weakest, at his very most needy, in his earthly form, he was stronger than the devil. And the devil had to retreat and, and wait to come back till an opportune time, it tells us inside that verse. His strength to vanquish his enemy has already rang through the halls of hell. Jesus' compassion for his people may cause him to stoop like a servant, but as he bows down to his father, he makes the lowly and brings them up. He, he brings down hell as he raises up the captives. He crushes the power and cuts off the oxygen to this kingdom of evil as he restores life to those people in most need. And so Jesus' um, servant persona and his holy one of God, his warrior persona, they are one and the same And that as Jesus claims back territory um, in the souls of his people, he is truly conquering evil and he's truly letting other people free. And it's always at his own expense. Jesus is always strong and mighty to save and he's always offering of himself to those in need. Jesus' assault was in full force on the powers of darkness. Um, as yet unseen in the biblical narrative. Jesus' messianic status uh, meant that he would do spiritual war like never before, and Jesus is the destroyer of demon strongholds, even as he is the restorer of the captive. God spoke the world into existence, and what does he do to combat this demon? He speaks his word to the demon and commands it, be quiet, come out of him. 
It says that in verse 35. Be quiet, come ahead of him. And when the demon had thrown him to the, uh, down in the midst of the people, he came out of him without doing him any harm. Jesus spoke and the powers of darkness responded. The world is going to see the curse driven back like they had never seen before. The curse that had gone throughout the land that had oppressed nations and now is oppressing uh, uh, individuals, we see that even on an individual scale, Jesus is driving back the darkness and reversing the course of corruption on, on, the, on his creation. He is coming back to do war with the devil. And so Jesus here is, yeah, he's great. He's a servant and he's healing people, but you can see how he's really trying to, uh, the, the narrative is, is painting him as one who's assertive, as one who's mighty, as one who's still a man and still cares for the people, but he's still a glorious God. He's a glorious God that is not going to let evil have its way. And so God spoke the world into his existence and his word is going out in force to drive back the curse's grip on creation. Jesus is the servant proclaiming the good news just as we saw he expected he would in Isaiah 61. His word is authoritative and we see this as the point of these miracles. It's his authority that, that ends up being the question of these, um, these miracles. His word is authoritative to reverse Satan's grip. Um, and Jesus is then shown as a warrior king like David. Serpent, seed beware. The seed of the woman, the faithful son of David, is here to crush your head. Verses, verse 34, Jesus is stern and, and he rebukes with force. You can see that in your version. In verse 35, Jesus rebuked him. Some other versions might say he he, was, um, he sternly rebuked. This is a, a, a powerful word. This is a powerful rebuke. He was not probably very quiet when he said these things. Um, Jesus has the power to destroy them, and this is something that we see the, the demon himself actually knew. Have you come to destroy us? He's not seeing Jesus as this agent of peace. He's not seeing Jesus as this sort of whimsical force that fills up the room like like gas, like, oh, you could turn on some oxygen and fill up the room and you'd never know, but we all have a little more oxygen in our blood. No, Jesus is like coming in here and he's willing to destroy and the, and the demon is terrified. And when Jesus commands the demon, he commands the outcome as well because the, this man is thrown to the ground and yet G, the, Luke, the physician, really picks up on the fact, but he wasn't her, harmed. Jesus commands the demon and he commands the outcome. This man was free from oppression And this process, though violent, did not cause harm to the man himself. And so the point we see here is in verse 36 and 37. The amazement came, and amazement came upon them, uh, one another, saying, What is this message? For with authority and power he commands unclean spirits, and they came out. And the report about him was spreading into every locality in the surrounding district. This question of what is this message is interesting for us because, of course, we sort of have a, an index of things we know Jesus, the kind of things he would teach. Um, but in this narrative itself, outside of the message they, that he gave in Nazareth, he, they actually don't say what he's saying in um, these synagogues until our very last verse we're going to look at today. Uh, sorry, I guess the second to last verse would be verse 43. But don't ruin it for yourself, just joking. Um, <laughs> so what is this message? He has so much authority and power so what does this say about the things that he's teaching in our synagogues? He's gone to the heart of our worship and our understanding of God's will, the place where Jews would understand and discuss God's word. And his teaching there, you know, we're sort of left to wonder up until the very last. They're sort of teasing us. Um, but the fact is, is that Jesus was, was his message was not, or his, his miracle was not about um, the shock factor. The, the point was that he, uh, his power confronted his audience with the necessity to consider the authority of his message. The demon also here isn't saved by his confession. Do you notice that? He knows the truth about who Jesus is. He says, you're the Holy One of God. That's a, I mean, that's the kind of thing that if Peter says it, something like that, you know, Peter gets a compliment. What's the difference between the demon's confession and, and a confession like ours? or a confession that God desires. The confession in and of itself, maybe let's say for our purposes, just saying the prayer in and of itself doesn't seem 
to go very far for these demons. The demon wasn't saved by his confession, and neither will the crowds by their amazement and the report that they spread about him. Um, Such power has never been displayed, but what is his message? They must come under the authority of his message and submit to the teaching of Jesus to be saved. Jesus, uh, his words hold power. The warrior king is doing uh, doing battle with the powers of evil, and so they have heard his words too, and so what does this say about their need for a response? Um, the good news is coming to the captives, and the spiritual powers are under submission to his people. Uh, uh, sorry, the spiritual powers are under, under the submission of Jesus, and so what does that say about what his people need to do to find freedom? They must submit themselves voluntarily if they don't want to be driven out in judgment. So in summary, the message here is not given um, just as the audience, we are shown the evidence of his power and the t- intent of his message's implementation. There's freedom for the captives. But the specifics are left here to build up some anticipation. So continuing on in 38, then he got up and left the synagogue and entered Simon's home. Now Simon's mother-in-law was suffering from a high fever, and they asked him to help her. Um, and standing over her, he rebuked the fever, and it left her, and she immediately got up and waited on them. So uh, we remember that Luke, he admitted that he found many other sources, that he was compiling the very best sources to make his gospel. This passage mostly comes from Mark, um, and you can see a couple of uh, Mark's sort of signatures here. Um, But this high fever, it shows there's urgency, and it shows probably these are back-to-back events, right? Uh, The high fever shows urgency, and it's compounded by the fact that he goes straight from the synagogue to this home. So they see he's done this amazing miracle. He's driven out a demon. We know another place you got to go, Jesus, come on. So they take him, and he's, he's going into the home of, of Simon, who we know end up, ends up becoming Peter, right? The disciple Peter. Um, and so uh, in verse 39, you can see that this is the only instance in Luke's 16 healings where Jesus addresses the illness and not the sick, the sick person which um, commentators agree is intentional, that he is actually speaking to the illness rather than the sick person, suggests that this is actually a fever brought on by some kind of demonic oppression. The fact that this um, woman was not addressed in and of herself, but he's addressing and commanding evil to leave um, is really interesting. And so most commentators would agree that this is also, in effect, another exorcism. not every sickness is a result of some spiritual power, uh, and we're going to see that exemplified in some of the, the following verses. You know, I don't think the devil's in Anna's you know, stomach bug she's got today, uh, but apparently there are some instances where you know, illness is truly, um, truly demonic, and Jesus here commands evil to leave. And so she gets up and immediately helps um, and serves the people there, not just Jesus, but everyone. Jesus' first miracle helped a man. The second helped a woman. And so Luke sees power, his power and, and purpose um, advance through women and men alike, men and women alike. The woman is the one who reciprocates, though. She's the one who gets up and immediately serves the people at her home. She immediately gets up and, and becomes the hostess and, be, and blesses others with the bless, blessing she receives. And this uh, immediately word is one of the one of the hallmarks of Mark's gospel. Immediately, everything about Mark's gospel is, is, is um, just so rushed. <laughs> it's um, so impending. Everything's immediately. He always says immediately. Where Luke says authority, uh, Mark is showing she immediately got up. This was an exacting kind of moment of healing, and she, she responded in faith immediately. So, um, you know, I think here we see It's interesting that Jesus has commanded evil with his words, but he's not beyond touching and being tactile with the people that he loves, and we'll see that in the the next verse. In verse 40, while the sun was setting, all those who who were sick, um, I am losing my spot. While the sun was setting, all those who had any who were sick with various diseases brought them to him, and laying his hands on each one of them, he was healing them. Demons were coming out of the man sh- uh, out of many, shouting, You are the Son of God, but rebuking them, he would not allow them to speak, 
because he knew, they knew him to be the Christ. And so the sun was setting the same day. Jesus has had some back-to-back miracles. It's been a miraculous day. The sun is setting. Plenty of people are coming. And instead of rebuking the fever and these following people, he's laying his hands on them. Jesus is tactile too. His words are used to command demons, and he didn't touch evil. He commanded it and kept himself separate from it, much like the holy man of God, the Nazarite, Samson, ought to have done, right? Um, But he did touch the needy. He did touch the oppressed. Um, He embraced those who sought his healing um, and who didn't have something to be conquered in them first, something evil, right? Jesus was a man of conflict and comfort. We have to really try to fight the care bear, hippie, chimera kind of view that we have of Jesus. Jesus was a man of conflict and comfort. He was going to do war against evil, and he was going to do war to rescue those people most in need because he loved them, right? He could have spoken to the ill, but he decided to hold them instead. Just like the shepherd described in Isaiah 40, 10 and 11, another servant um, song that we see, uh, you know, satisfied in Jesus. It says, behold, the Lord God comes with might, with his arm. He establishes his rule. He's a strong warrior king. He's establishing his rule. His reward is with him and his recompense uh, accompanies him. And yet it says this right after that. He tends his flock like a shepherd. He gathers his lambs in his arms and he carries those them close to his heart. He gently leads the nursing ewes. So Jesus, as the servant king, he is strong. He is bringing war. He is ruling with his might, and yet he leads the shepherds and or, sorry, he leads the sheep and gathers the lambs in his arms, and he's gentle with the most needy. Jesus is totally satisfying this in um, in his ministry here, and we see his his character is one of strength and one of care. He is a man of conflict and a man of comfort. Uh, in verse forty one, that we also read, uh, we see another sort of secret that he um, another clue that he took this from Mark. And this is Mark's motif of uh, the messianic secret. Um, The fact that Jesus would not allow the demons to speak truth about him, right? They were speaking truth, but he would not entrust his testimony to them. Uh, Mark highlights this a lot in his gospel. You only really find um, the, the sort of messianic pronouncements at the very end, and it's the centurion, the Gentile, that says, surely this was the man of God. Luke, of course, is highlighting this, this sort of aspect of this story, but it's not very much um, a theme of his work, but it's here, and so we should talk about it, um, and that Jesus, he would not uh, entrust his testimony to those who he didn't trust truly believed, right? He would, of course, give people a chance. Um, he, he, of course, preached to the people in Na- uh, Nazareth, but when it comes to the demons, these people who were not submissive to his message, he would not allow them to share who he was. And we see this um, later as well in that Jesus is not going to entrust himself to those who misunderstood his messianic mission. The people that were looking forward to the Messiah in his day needed to look forward to his brand of being a Messiah, what he came to accomplish. And you, you see it at the very end of this chapter and you see it in the disciples themselves. Peter says, no, don't go to Jerusalem. You know, there's people that are constantly trying to control Jesus's ministry and he says no I actually have the final say on what I'm doing here because I follow the father and the spirit's leading me so Jesus's messianic secret can sometimes confuse us but um, the messianic secret was to sort of show that Jesus he was the one that had the final say in what he came to do and this matches Luke's focus on the divisive nature of Jesus's ministry Jesus was not seeking universal approval his claim to the Davidic throne was used to reveal the hearts of those who truly loved him. Mark didn't want demons and unbelievers to control his testimony, um, and Luke doesn't want us mistaking the the denial that Jesus Jesus faces um, as failure, but as an integral part of his ministry, right? The truth of the Messiah uh, did not just come in confession, but it came in submission to his message a message still, still being alluded to that we'll see at the very end of this chapter. Jesus would not entrust his testimony to those who would not submit, not during his time on earth. And so in 42, it says, when the day came, Jesus left 
and went to a secluded place, and the crowds were searching for him, and came and tried to keep him from going away from them. See, man's trying to enforce his rule over Jesus' ministry and power, right there. Verse 43, he said to them, I must preach the kingdom of God to the other cities also, for I was sent for this purpose. Jesus, the man, goes to find refuge after spiritual battle. Um, he is unrelatable in his perfect character. He is totally alien to us in the fact that he is God, right? Um, but he, Jesus is relatable to us in that he holds human weakness, and he's decided to relate to us in our experience. He isn't relatable. He's foreign, but he chooses to come to his people. God has incarnated himself in, in weakness, and we see him seek refuge after a long day. He goes to a secluded place to find rest, something that Jesus needed as a person and we need as people too. They tried to keep Jesus from leaving them, um, and Jesus would not be subject to the will of man, and he would not subject himself to the will of demons. He would only obey his father. His role as the servant was to come, uh, to, uh, to, was to be the one sent, right? As we see in Isaiah 61, the spirit of the Lord is on me because the Lord has anointed me to preach the good news to the poor, he has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted and proclaim liberty to the captives and freedom for the prisoners to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. So he came to do what? To preach the good news. So what does he say to them? You want me to set up a, you know, a sort of a lab and we can start to heal the world's diseases and you can bring me the poor and the oppressed and, and I can spend my earthly ministry just sort of helping you along on your earthly journey. He says, no, I came to preach the good news. Like, how interesting is it that he didn't establish, like, a children's hospital or something like that? Um, you know, why, like, that's where we think. But Jesus is looking at this grander scale of spiritual oppression, of war that's being done on his people, and he knows that this life is going to be temporary one way or another. And so he must fight the eternal battle. He must fight the battle of reestablishing kingdom rule on earth through his believers and kingdom rule when he ascends to the throne in heaven so that spiritual oppression can always be done away with and that when we escape this earth with life's final war with pain, as I love how that's, that hymn puts it, life's final war with pain, that it's actually a gift in the fact that we are free from suffering and loss because he has achieved victory on the other side of death. There is freedom from oppression and pain. And Jesus would leave behind a church that would care for the poor, that would help the sick, that would establish um, colleges and, and hospitals and do amazing things and change the face of this world. And so he was going to establish those things too. And so Jesus, he came though for that ultimate purpose of overthrowing spiritual oppression. This point in verse 43, uh, 43 contextualizes the works of power which came before him. What was his teaching? What is this teaching that he brings us? Oh, it's the teaching of the kingdom of God. He must go and preach it to the other cities also. So that's our clue. That's what he was preaching to them. The kingdom of God, as we see in other, um, other uh, gospel accounts, the kingdom of God is at hand. The kingdom of God is here. The gospel of the kingdom is something you hear all through Mark, all through Matthew. And it's something we actually hear um, a lot in Luke. In Luke, it's introduced later. This idea of the kingdom is introduced later than all the synoptic gospels. Uh, but according to this guy, Robert Stein, um, a scholar, he says the expression occurs 31 times in Luke and kingdom occurs the, another six times. And so why does Luke wait so long to tell us the point of his ministry? It's because he's been telling us for four chapters. He just hasn't used the word, right? <laughs> Jesus was pronounced by angels as the son of God most high who would rule on the throne of David, who, whose rule would never end. Jesus was coming, uh, was announced to the shepherds who were told that he would bring peace on earth, not to all earth, but to those in whom found God's pleasure, right? Pious Jews were told of his coming through works of the Spirit like they hadn't imagined. Anna and Zechariah knew that Jesus was the promised Messiah, a sign to be opposed, and that he would cause the fall and rise of many in Israel. As a child, Jesus showed a man's understanding of the Torah, he knew his identity as the, father of, as, as the son of his father, whose home was the temple. That's, that's a big claim. Zechariah and Elizabeth were promised a son who would be the Elijah-like prophet and who's a messenger preparing um, God's people for the Messiah's arrival among his people. And so John the Baptist, he did preach repentance, and it went to the wilderness, and it went to the halls of power. 
that actually got him imprisoned. Everyone heard the message of repentance. Everybody was prepared for the one that would come after him, the one that would be greater than he, the one who would bring a baptism of the Spirit. And inside John's ministry, um, Jesus did receive baptism. And this, he was, in fact, baptized by the Holy Spirit. His anointing that he received rent heaven, and the Spirit did baptize. He anointed him as the Son of God. We see in that passage that it's Psalm 2 that's quoted. Um, this, behold, this is my beloved Son in whom I'm well pleased. A messianic prophecy that the Son of God, the Davidic King, would be established with those words. And at his baptism, those words were, were spoken by God himself. Um, the Davidic king would smash the nations who rise up in vain, claiming freedom from oppression. That's how it is in Psalm 2. It's, oh, all these kingdoms rise up in vain. Oh, look at those lowly people. We must save the oppressed. We must save them from this oppressive, old-fashioned religion that's trying to do these terrible things. And God laughs. He says, I establish my king in, in Zion. Jesus is at war with the spiritual forces that animated their kingdoms, and he claimed peace and justice um, for himself, any claim from, uh, of peace and justice apart from his throne uh, would cause judgment to rain down on them, and all who would take refuge in him would be saved. Then we see that Jesus is led by the Spirit. As Israel's king, he is led to represent Israel as a nation. As they recapitulate his story, um, their story of Israel in, in the wilderness, Jesus is the faithful son of God. Just as David was God's son and Israel was God's son, Jesus is the true son of God to represent his people who would be faithful in the time of temptation in the wilderness. Jesus' filial relationship with his father is defined by obedience and spirit leadership and mastery over the word. Then up to this point, we see that Jesus is led by the spirit, um, which, of course, that spirit is the one promised to the servant, right? Right? Uh, the Spirit would lead him into another conflict where he would be rejected by his own people. The community that knew him best, the community that knew the Torah best, doubted Jesus' messianic claims. Jesus' rebuttal was straightforward. And it's interesting that the people gathered in, in love for the word were the ones that were most offended by a straightforward teaching from the Bible, right? Um, uh, the fact that God had a habit of making and saving outsiders who ex accepted him, unclean Gentiles included, there would be no hope for those who would not accept the kingdom rule that was inaugurated by him. As he said in our last sermon, right? Today, this is uh, satisfied in your hearing. The year of the Lord's favor was satisfied in their hearing and brought judgment, on the weak, uh, judgment for the wicked with it. The promise about uh, um, Gentile salvation and, and all the escalations that we see in Isaiah 61, um, you know, he, it would be magnified without them if they didn't accept him. And their response was to throw their king off a hill to soften up his body for stoning and thankfully he escapes, right? And so Jesus leaves the insiders and goes to people who are the outsiders and Jesus begins the display of his power. Reflective of his credibility and the purpose of his ministry, demons were driven out at the word of rebuke. These demons knew his identity, the son of God, which is terms used for the king, the messianic king, the demons knew they could, uh, the king could destroy, and they feel the force of his kingdom's power. He rebukes evil, and the ca captives are led free. Jesus liberates um, the dominion, people from the dominion of the demonic kingdom. These are feats never before seen. And so this whole point, the final, the, the first time that we see um, the kingdom of God spoken in, in uh, Luke, it's after the fact that Jesus' whole ministry, every single Old Testament quotation, every single prophecy given by the Spirit to the different people in the birth narrative, every single act that he's going through, whether it's uh, demonic overthrow or whether it's um, facing temptation, every single thing is point, propping up this point that his whole ministry needs to be understood in terms of the overthrow of spiritual oppression, the establishment of his rule as he assaults the kingdom of evil, and their earthly counterparts, and his eventual victory as the Son, obedient unto death, resurrected because he is mighty to save and enthroned at the right hand of God, where he now rules. The whole presentation of the gospel that you see in the book of Acts, which is the same author of this, it always ends with the point that Jesus, he's sitting at the right hand of the throne of God. 
He is presently king. He is presently ruling. And so Luke's narrative builds up this point here that he really is the king, despite what everybody thinks, despite everybody's perception of him. He really is overthrowing, and he really is doing away with evil, and he's claiming back the land brought under the oppression of the curse. Um, And so Jesus is the victor. He's spreading his rule, propagated by the image of himself in men and women that he saves across borders and across time. The curse's grip is losing um, power over his creation. He's reigning at the right hand of the Father until all his enemies are made his footstool. That's the most quoted verse in the New Testament of the Old Testament. Psalm 110, verse 1, that he is reigning at the right hand until all his enemies are made his footstool. And so Jesus, in this whole passage, just to wrap up, that the kingdom overthrow has begun. Jesus is doing war on evil. As he's reaching out to the oppressed, as he's healing those who are sick, as he's um, excising demons, he is overthrowing spiritual oppression in all its forms in the forms of the consequences of the curse through illness, through poverty, through oppression, through broken political systems, and in spiritual possession itself. You know, if you find somebody that you worry might have some kind of demonic possession, uh, just present the gospel to them, right? You want them to have a new spirit. Um, You think they're possessed by a poor spirit or or an evil spirit, give them the Holy Spirit. Preach the gospel to them. See if it works, right? Don't worry about hoo-ha and magic and, and oil and hand signs, right? You have the power of the gospel in you. Um, the power that Jesus came to give life is the power that lives inside you and it's the power that you have to reach out to those people in your life that are most needy. And so the, the power and kingdom and authority belongs to him. And so let's live like it. Let's realize that Jesus, he is the king and we're representatives of that kingdom even as we're looking forward to that final kingdom. Let's not under-realize our eschatology and pretend like we're just holding on and waiting for him to come back. Yes, we're holding on, we're waiting for him to come back and complete it all. But Jesus, what he started, he really did. It's really satisfied in his hearing. And you really do have the spiritual power available to him because he brought life to you and you can be used as a vessel to bring life to others. So let's end it there. All right, let's stand and sing Higher Ground. It's 532 in your hymnal.
worship you and to praise your name. Thank you for uh, the songs that we can sing to praise you. Thank you for the message from your word. Thank you for our pastor. I ask you to give healing for uh, Anna and Henry and um, others that are not able to be with us today. Uh, just bless us as we leave this place. Uh, let us truly um, remember and, and carry this salt and light um, to others around us. And we thank you again in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.